I called upon the voice to help me, for I should never have imagined that the voice and the ghost were one. You have heard about the opera ghost, have you not, Raoul? Yes, but tell me what happened when you were on the white horse of the Propheta. I made no movement and let myself go. The black shape held me up, and I made no effort to escape. A curious feeling of peacefulness came over me, and I thought that I must be under the influence of some cordial. I had the full command of my senses, and my eyes became used to the darkness which was lit, here and there by fitful gleams. I calculated that we were in a narrow circular gallery, probably running all around the opera, which is immense underground. I had once been down into those cellars, but had stopped at the third floor, though there were two lower still large enough to hold a town. But the figures of which I caught sight had made me run away. There are demons down there, quite black, standing in front of boilers, and they wield shovels and pitchforks, and poke up fires and stir up flames, and, if you come too near to them, they frighten you by suddenly opening the red mouths of their furnaces. Well, while César was quietly carrying me on his back, I saw those black demons in the distance, looking quite small, in front of the red fires of their furnaces. They came into sight, disappeared, and came into sight again as we went on our winding way. At last they disappeared altogether. The shape was still holding me up, and Caesar walked on, unled and sure-footed. I could not tell you even approximately how long this ride lasted. I only know that we seemed to turn and turn and often went down a spiral stair into the very heart of the earth. Even then it may be that my head was turning, but I don't think so. No, my mind was quite clear. At last Caesar raised his nostrils, sniffed the air, and quickened his pace a little. I felt a moistness in the air, and Caesar stopped. A darkness had lifted. A sort of bluey light surrounded us. We were on the edge of a lake, whose leaden waters stretched into the distance, into the darkness. But the blue light lit up the bank, and I saw a little boat fastened to an iron ring on the wharf. A boat? Yes, but I knew that all that existed, and that there was nothing supernatural about that underground lake and boat. But think of the exceptional conditions in which I arrived upon that shore. I don't know whether the effects of the cordial had worn off when the man's shape lifted me into the boat, but my terror began all over again. My gruesome escort must have noticed it, for he sent Caesar back, and I heard his hoofs trampling up a staircase, while the man jumped into the boat, untied the rope that held it, and seized the oars. He rowed with a quick, powerful stroke, and his eyes, under the mask, never left me. We slipped across to the noiseless water in the bluey light which I told you of. Then we were in the dark again, and we touched shore, and I was once more taken up in the man's arms. I cried aloud, and then suddenly I was silent, dazed by the light. Yes, a dazzling light, in the midst of which I had been put down. I sprang to my feet. I was in the middle of a drawing-room that seemed to me to be decorated, adorned and furnished with nothing but flowers, flowers both magnificent and stupid, because of the silk ribbons that tied them to baskets like those which they sell in the shops on the boulevards. They were much too civilized flowers, like those which I used to find in my dressing-room after a first night. And in the midst of all these flowers stood the black shape of the man in the mask, with arms crossed, and he said, Don't be afraid, Christine, you are in no danger. It was the voice! My anger equaled my amazement. I rushed at the mask and tried to snatch it away, so as to see the face of the voice. The man said, You are in no danger so long as you do not touch the mask. And taking me gently by the wrists, he forced me into a chair, and then went down on his knees before me, and said nothing more. His humility gave me back some of my courage, and the light restored me to the realities of life. However extraordinary the adventure might be, I was now surrounded by mortal, visible, tangible things the furniture, the hangings, the candles, the vases, and the very flowers in their baskets, of which I could almost have told whence they came and what they cost, were bound to confine my imagination to the limits of a drawing-room, quite as commonplace as any, that at least had the excuse of not being in the cellars of the opera. I had, no doubt, to do with a terrible eccentric person who, in some mysterious fashion, had succeeded in taking up his abode there, 
under the opera house five stories below the level of the ground. And the voice, the voice which I had recognized under the mask, was on its knees before me, was a man, and I began to cry. The man, still kneeling, must have understood the cause of my tears, for he said, It is true, Christine, I am not an angel, nor a genius, nor a ghost. I am Eric. Christine's narrative was again interrupted, and echo behind them seemed to repeat the word after her. Eric! What echo? They both turned round and saw that night had fallen. Raoul made a movement as though to rise, but Christine kept him beside her. Don't go, she said. I want you to know everything here. But why here, Christine? I am afraid of your catching cold. We have nothing to fear except the trap doors, dear, and here we are miles away from the trap doors, and I am not allowed to see you outside the theatre. This is not the time to annoy him. We must not arouse his suspicion. Christine, Christine, something tells me you are wrong to wait till tomorrow evening and that we ought to fly at once. I tell you that if he does not hear me sing tomorrow, it will cause him infinite pain. It is difficult not to cause him pain and yet to escape from him for good. You are right in that, Raoul, for certainly he will die of my flight. And she added in a dull voice, But then it counts both ways, for we risk his killing us. Does he love you so much? He would commit murder for me. But one can find out where he lives, one can go in search of him. Now that we know that Eric is not a ghost, one can speak to him and force him to answer. Christine shook her head. No, no, there is nothing to be done with Eric except to run away. Then why, when you are able to run away, did you go back to him? Because I had to, and you will understand that when I tell you how I left him. Oh, I hate him, cried Raoul. And you, Christine, tell me, do you hate him too? No, said Christine simply. No, of course not. Why, you love him. Your fear, your terror, all of that is just love, and love of the most exquisite kind, the kind which people do not admit even to themselves, said Raoul bitterly. The kind that gives you a thrill when you think of it. Picture it, a man who lives in a palace underground. And he gave a leer. Then you want me to go back there? said the young girl cruelly. Take care, Raoul, I have told you, I should never return. There was an appalling silence between the three of them. The two who spoke, and the shadow that listened behind them. Before answering that, said Raoul at last, speaking very slowly, I should like to know with what feeling he inspires you, since you do not hate him. With horror, she said. That is the terrible thing about it. He fills me with horror, and I do not hate him. How can I hate him, Raoul? Think of Eric at my feet, in the house, on the lake, underground. He accuses himself, he curses himself, he implores my forgiveness. He confesses his cheat. He loves me. He lays at my feet an immense and tragic love. He has carried me off for love. He has imprisoned me with him, underground, for love. But he respects me. He crawls. He moans, he weeps, and when I stood up, Raoul, and told him that I could only despise him if he did not, then and there give me my liberty, he offered it. He offered to show me the mysterious road. Only, only he rose too, and I was made to remember that, though he was not an angel, nor a ghost, nor a genius, he remained the voice, for he sang. And I listened, and stayed. That night we did not exchange another word. He sang me to sleep. When I woke up I was alone, lying on a sofa in a simply furnished little bedroom, with an ordinary mahogany bedstead, lit by a lamp standing on the marble top of an old Louis-Philippe chest of drawers. I soon discovered that I was a prisoner, and that the only outlet from my room was led to a very comfortable bathroom. On returning to the bedroom I saw on the chest of drawers a note, in red ink, which said, my dear Christine, you need have no concern as to your fate. You have no better nor more respectful friend in the world than myself. You are alone, at present, in this home which is yours. I am going out shopping to fetch you all the things that you can need. 
I felt sure that I had fallen into the hands of a madman. I ran round my little apartment, looking for a way of escape which I could not find. I upbraided myself for my absurd superstition which had caused me to fall into the trap. I felt inclined to laugh and to cry at the same time. This was the state of mind in which Eric found me. After giving three taps on the wall, he walked in quietly through a door which I had not noticed and which he left open. He had his arms full of boxes and parcels, and arranged them on the bed in a leisurely fashion, while I overwhelmed him with abuse and called upon him to take off his mask, if it covered the face of an honest man. He replied serenely, "'You shall never see Eric's face.' and he reproached me with not having finished dressing at that time of day. He was good enough to tell me that it was two o'clock in the afternoon. He said he would give me half an hour, and while he spoke, wound up my watch and set it for me, after which he asked me to come to the dining-room, where a nice lunch was waiting for us. I was very angry, slammed the door in his face, and went to the bathroom. When I came out again, feeling greatly refreshed, Eric said that he loved me, but that he would never tell me so except when I allowed him, and that the rest of the time would be devoted to music. "'What do you mean by the rest of the time?' I asked. Five days,' he said, with decision. I asked him if I should then be free, and he said, "'You will be free, Christine, for when those five days are past, you will have learned not to see me. And then, from time to time, you will come to see your poor Eric.' He pointed to a chair opposite him, at a small table, and I sat down, feeling greatly perturbed. However, I ate a few prawns and the wing of a chicken, and drank half a glass of tokay, which he had made himself, he told me, brought from the Königsberg cellars. Eric did not eat or drink. I asked him what his nationality was, and if that name of Eric did not point out his Scandinavian origin. He said that he had no name and no country, and that he had taken the name of Eric by accident. After lunch he rose and gave me the tips of his fingers, saying that he would like to show me over his flat. But I snatched away my hand and gave a cry. What I had touched was cold, and at the same time bony, and I remembered that his hands smelled of death. "'Oh, forgive me,' he moaned, and he opened a door before me. "'This is my bedroom, if you care to see it. It is rather curious. His manners, his words, his attitude gave me confidence, and I went in without hesitation. I felt as if I were entering the room of a dead person. The walls were all hung with black, but instead of the white trimmings that usually set off that funereal upholstery, there was an enormous stave of music with the notes of the Dies Irae many times repeated. In the middle of the room was a canopy, from which hung curtains of red brocaded stuff, and under the canopy an open coffin. "'That is where I sleep,' said Eric. "'One has to get used to everything in life, even to eternity.' The sight upset me so much that I turned away my head. Then I saw the keyboard of an organ which filled one whole side of the walls. On the desk was a music-book covered with red notes. I asked leave to look at it, and read, "'Don Juan Triumphant.' "'Yes,' he said. "'I compose sometimes.' "'I began that work twenty years ago.' When I have finished, I shall take it away with me in that coffin, and never wake up again. "'You must work at it as seldom as you can,' I said. He replied, "'I sometimes work at it for fourteen days and nights together, during which I live on music only. And then I rest for years at a time. "'Will you play me something out of your Don Juan Triumphant?' I asked, thinking to please him. "'You must never ask me that,' he said, in a gloomy voice. I will play you Mozart, if you like, which will only make you weep, but my Don Juan, Christine, burns, and yet he is not struck by fire from heaven. Thereupon we returned to the drawing-room. I noticed that there was no mirror in the whole apartment. I was going to remark upon this, but Eric had already sat down to the piano. He said, You see, Christine, there is some music that is so terrible that it consumes all those who approach it. Fortunately, you have not come to that music yet, for you would lose all your pretty colouring, and nobody would know you when you returned to Paris. Let us sing something from the opera, Christine Day. He spoke these last words as though he were flinging an insult at me. What did you do? 
I had no time to think about the meaning he put into words. We at once began the duet in Othello, and already the catastrophe was upon us. I sang Desdemona with a despair, a terror which I had never displayed before. As for him, his voice thundered forth his revengeful soul at every note. Love, jealousy, hatred, burst out around us in harrowing cries. Eric's black mask made me think of the natural mask of the Moor of Venice. He was Othello himself. Suddenly I felt a need to see beneath the mask. I wanted to know the face of the voice, and with a movement which I was utterly unable to control, swiftly my fingers tore away the mask. Oh, horror! 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 Christine stopped at the thought of the vision that had scared her, while the echoes of the night which had repeated the name of Eric now thrice moaned the cry. Horror! 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 Raoul and Christine, clasping each other closely, raised their eyes to the stars that shone in a clear and peaceful sky. Raoul said, Strange, Christine, that this calm, soft night should be so full of plaintive sounds. One would think that it was sorrowing with us. When you know the secret, Raoul, your ears, like mine, will be full of lamentations. She took Raoul's protecting hands in hers, and, with a long shiver, continued. Yes, if I lived to be a hundred, I should always hear the superhuman cry of grief and rage which he uttered when the terrible sight appeared before my eyes. Raoul, you have seen death's heads, when they have been dried and withered by the centuries, and perhaps, if you were not the victim of a nightmare, you saw his death's head at Peros, and then you saw red death stalking about at the last masked ball. But all those death's heads were motionless, and their dumb horror was not alive. But imagine, if you can, red death's mask suddenly coming to life in order to express, with the four black holes of its eyes, its nose, and its mouth, the extreme anger, the mighty fury of a demon. And not a ray of light from the sockets, for as I learned later, you cannot see his blazing eyes except in the dark. I fell back against the wall, and he came up to me, grinding his teeth, and as I fell upon my knees, he hissed mad incoherent words and curses at me. Leaning over me, he cried, Look, you want to see? See! Feast your eyes, glut your soul on my cursed ugliness. Look at Eric's face. Now you know the face of the voice. You were not content to hear me, eh? You wanted to know what I looked like. Oh, you women are so inquisitive. Well, are you satisfied? I'm a very good-looking fellow, eh? When a woman has seen me, as you have, she belongs to me. She loves me forever. I'm a kind of Don Juan, you know. And, drawing himself up to his full height, with his hand on his hip, wagging the hideous thing that was his head on his shoulders, he roared, Look at me! I am Don Juan Triumphant! And when I turned away my head and begged for mercy, he drew it to him, brutally, twisting his dead fingers into my hair. Enough, enough, cried Raoul. I will kill him. In heaven's name, Christine, tell me where the dining room on the lake is. I must kill him. Oh, be quiet, Raoul, if you want to know. Yes, and I want to know how and why you went back. I must know. But in any case, I will kill him. Oh, Raoul, listen, listen. He dragged me by my hair, and then, and then, oh, it is too horrible. Well, what? Out with it exclaimed Raoul fiercely. Out with it, quick! Then he hissed at me. Ah, I frighten you, do I? I dare say. Perhaps you think that I have another mask, eh? And that this, this head is a mask. Well, he roared, tear it off as you did the other. Come, come along, I insist. Your hands, your hands, give me your hands. And he seized my hands and dug them into his awful face. He tore his flesh with my nails, tore his terrible dead flesh with my nails. No, he shouted, while his throat throbbed and panted like a furnace. Know that I am built up of death from head to foot, and that it is a corpse that loves you and adores you and will never, never leave you. Look, I am not laughing now, I am crying, crying for you, Christine, who have torn off my mask and who therefore can never leave me again. As long as you thought me handsome, you could have come back. I know you would have come back, but now that you know my hideousness, you would run away for good. So I shall keep you here. Why did you want to see me? Oh, mad Christine, who wanted to see me? 
when my own father never saw me, and when my own mother, so as not to see me, made me a present of my first mask. He had let go of me at last, and was dragging himself about on the floor, uttering terrible sobs, and then he crawled away like a snake, went into his room, closed the door, and left me alone to my reflections. Presently I heard the sound of the organ, and then I began to understand Eric's contemptuous phrase when he spoke about opera music. What I now heard was utterly different from what I had heard up to then. His Don Juan triumphant, for I had not a doubt but that he had rushed to his masterpiece to forget the horror of the moment, seemed to me at first one long, awful, magnificent sob. But little by little it expressed every emotion, every suffering of which mankind is capable. It intoxicated me, and I opened the door that separated us. Eric rose as I entered, but dared not turn in my direction. "'Eric,' I cried, "'show me your face without fear. I swear that you are the most unhappy and sublime of men, and if ever again I shiver when I look at you, it will be because I am thinking of the splendor of your genius.' Then Eric turned round, for he believed me, and I also had faith in myself. He fell at my feet with words of love with words of love in his dead mouth, and the music had ceased. He kissed the hem of my dress, and did not see that I closed my eyes. What more can I tell you, dear? You know the tragedy. It went on for a fortnight, a fortnight during which I lied to him. My lies were as hideous as the monster who inspired them, but they were the price of my liberty. I burned his mask, and I managed so well that even when he was not singing he tried to catch my eye like a dog sitting by its master. He was my faithful slave, and paid me endless little attentions. Gradually I gave him such confidence that he ventured to take me walking on the banks of the lake, and to row me in the boat on its leaden waters. Toward the end of my captivity he let me out through the gates that closed the underground passages in the Rue Scribe. Here a carriage awaited us, and took us to the Bois. The night when we met you was nearly fatal to me, for he is terribly jealous of you, and I had to tell them that you were soon going away. Then, at last, after a fortnight of that horrible captivity, during which I was filled with pity, enthusiasm, despair, and horror by turns, he believed me when I said, I will come back. And you went back, Christine, groaned Raoul. Yes, dear, and I must tell you that it was not his frightful threats, when setting me free, that helped me to keep my word, but the harrowing sob which he gave on the threshold of the tomb. That sob attached me to the unfortunate man more than I myself suspected when saying good-bye to him. Poor Eric! Poor Eric! Christine, said Raoul, rising, you tell me that you love me, but you had recovered your liberty hardly a few hours before you returned to Eric. Remember the masked ball? Yes, and do you remember those hours which I passed with you, Raoul, to the great danger of both of us? I doubted your love for me during those hours. Do you doubt it still, Raoul? Then know that each of my visits to Eric increased my horror of him. For each of those visits, instead of calming him, as I hoped, made him mad with love. I am so frightened, so frightened. You are frightened, but do you love me? If Eric were good-looking, would you love me, Christine? She rose in her turn, putting her two trembling arms around the young man's neck, and said, Oh, my betrothed of a day, if I did not love you, I would not give you my lips. Take them for the first time and the last. He kissed her lips, but the night that surrounded them was rent asunder. They fled as at the approach of a storm, and their eyes, filled with dread for Eric, showed them, before they disappeared, high up above them, an immense night bird that stared at them with its blazing eyes, and seemed to cling to the string of Apollo's lyre. End of chapter 12 of The Phantom of the Opera Phantom of the Opera, chapter 13 A Master Stroke of the Trapdoor Lover Raoul and Christine ran, eager to escape from the roof and the blazing eyes that showed only in the dark. And they did not stop before they came to the eighth floor on the way down. There was no performance at the opera that night, and the passages were empty. Suddenly a queer-looking form stood before them and blocked the road. No, not this way! 
and the form pointed to another passage by which they were to reach the wings. Raoul wanted to stop and ask for an explanation, but the form, which wore a sort of long frock coat and a pointed cap, said, Quick! Go away quickly! Christine was already dragging Raoul, compelling him to start running again. But who is he? Who is that man? he asked. Christine replied, It's the Persian. What's he doing here? Nobody knows. He is always in the opera. You are making me run away for the first time in my life. If we really saw Eric, what I ought to have done was to nail him to Apollo's lyre, just as we nail the owls to the walls of our Breton farms, and there would have been no more question of him. My dear Raoul, you would first have had to climb up to Apollo's lyre. That is no easy matter. The blazing eyes were there. Oh, you are getting like me now, seeing him everywhere. What I took for blazing eyes was probably a couple of stars shining through the strings of the lyre. And Christine went down another floor, with Raoul following her. As you have quite made up your mind to go, Christine, I assure you it would be better to go at once. Why wait for tomorrow? He may have heard us tonight. No, no, he is working, I tell you, at his Don Juan triumphant and not thinking of us. You are so sure of that you keep on looking behind you. Come to my dressing room. Hadn't we better meet outside the opera? Never till we go away for good. It would bring us bad luck if I did not keep my word. I promised him to see you only here. It's a good thing for me that he allowed you even that. Do you know, said Raoul bitterly, that it was very plucky of you to let us play at being engaged? Why, my dear, he knows all about it. He said, I trust you, Christine. Monsieur de Chagny is in love with you and is going abroad. Before he goes, I want him to be as happy as I am. Are people so unhappy when they love? Yes, Christine, when they love and are not sure of being loved. They came to Christine's dressing room. Why do you think that you are safer in this room than on the stage? asked Raoul. You heard him through the walls here, therefore he can certainly hear us. No, he gave me his word not to be behind the walls of my dressing room again, and I believe Eric's word. This room and my bedroom on the lake are for me, exclusively, and not to be approached by him. How can you have gone from this room into that dark passage, Christine? Suppose we try to repeat your movements, shall we? It is dangerous, dear, for the glass might carry me off again, and instead of running away I should be obliged to go to the end of the secret passage, to the lake, and there call Eric. Would he hear you? Eric will hear me wherever I call him. He told me so. He is a very curious genius. You must not think, Raoul, that he is simply a man who amuses himself by living underground. He does things that no other man could do. He knows things which nobody in the world knows. Take care, Christine, you are making a ghost of him again. No, he is not a ghost. He is a man of heaven and earth, that is all. A man of heaven and earth? That is all, a nice way to speak of him. And are you still resolved to run away from him? Yes, tomorrow. Tomorrow. You will have no resolve left. Then, Raoul, you must run away with me in spite of myself. Is that understood? I shall be here at twelve tomorrow night. I shall keep my promise, whatever happens. You say that after listening to the performance, he is to wait for you in the dining room on the lake? Yes. And how are you to reach him if you don't know how to go out by the glass? Why, by going straight to the edge of the lake. Christine opened a box, took out an enormous key, and showed it to Raoul. What's that? he asked. The key of the gate to the underground passage in the Rue Scribe. I understand, Christine. It leads straight to the lake. Give it to me, Christine, will you? Never, she said. That would be treacherous. Suddenly Christine changed color. A mortal pallor overspread her features. "'Oh, heavens!' she cried. "'Eric! Eric! Have pity on me!' "'Hold your tongue,' said Raoul. "'You told me he could not hear you.' But the singer's attitude became more and more inexplicable. She wrung her fingers, repeating with a distraught air, "'Oh, heaven! Oh, heaven!' "'What is it? What is it?' Raoul implored. The ring, the gold ring he gave me. Oh, so Eric gave you that ring. You know he did, Raoul. But what you don't know is that, 
When he gave it to me, he said, I give you back your liberty, Christine, on condition that this ring is always on your finger. As long as you keep it, you will be protected against all danger, and Eric will remain your friend. But woe to you if you ever part with it, for Eric will have his revenge. My dear, my dear, the ring is gone. Woe to us both. They both looked for the ring, but could not find it. Christine refused to be pacified. "'It was while I gave you that kiss up above, under Apollo's lyre,' she said. "'The ring must have slipped from my finger and dropped into the street. We can never find it. And what misfortunes are in store for us now? Oh, to run away!' "'Let us run away at once,' Raoul insisted once more. She hesitated. He thought that she was going to say yes. Then her bright pupils became dimmed, and she said, "'No, to-morrow.' And she left him hurriedly, still ringing and rubbing her fingers, as though she hoped to bring the ring back like that. Raoul went home, greatly perturbed at all that he had heard. "'If I don't save her from the hands of that humbug,' he said aloud as he went to bed, "'she is lost. But I shall save her.' He put out his lamp and felt a need to insult Eric in the dark. Thrice over, he shouted, Humbug! 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 But suddenly he raised himself on his elbow. A cold sweat poured from his temples. Two eyes, like blazing coals, had appeared at the foot of his bed. They stared at him fixedly, terribly, in the darkness of the night. Raoul was no coward, and yet he trembled. He put out a groping, hesitating hand toward the table by his bedside. He found the matches and lit his candle. The eyes disappeared. Still uneasy in his mind, he thought to himself, She told me that his eyes only showed in the dark. His eyes have disappeared in the light. But he may be there still. And he rose, hunted about, went around the room. He looked under his bed like a child. Then he thought himself absurd, got into bed again, and blew out the candle. The eyes reappeared. He sat up and stared back at them with all the courage he possessed. Then he cried, Is that you, Eric, man, genius, or ghost? Is it you? He reflected, If it's he, he's on the balcony. Then he ran to the chest of drawers and groped for his revolver. He opened the balcony window, looked out, saw nothing, and closed the window again. He went back to bed, shivering, for the night was cold, and put the revolver on the table within his reach. The eyes were still there at the foot of the bed. Were they between the bed and the window pane, or behind the pane? That is to say, on the balcony? That was what Raoul wanted to know. He also wanted to know if those eyes belonged to a human being. He wanted to know everything. Then, patiently, calmly, he seized his revolver and took aim. He aimed a little above the two eyes. Surely, if they were eyes, and if above those two eyes there was a forehead, and if Raoul was not too clumsy... The shot made a terrible din amid the silence of the slumbering house, and while footsteps came hurrying along the passages, Raoul sat up with outstretched arm, ready to fire again if need be. This time the two eyes had disappeared. Servants appeared, carrying lights. Count Philippe, terribly anxious. What is it? I think I have been dreaming, replied the young man. I fired at two stars that kept me from sleeping. You are raving. Are you ill? For God's sake, tell me, Raoul, what happened? And the Count seized hold of the revolver. No, no, I'm not raving. Besides, we shall soon see. He got out of the bed put on a dressing-gown and slippers, took a light from the hands of a servant, and, opening the window, stepped out on the balcony. The Count saw that the window had been pierced by a bullet at a man's height. Raoul was leaning over the balcony with his candle. "'Aha!' he said. "'Blood! Blood! Here! There! More blood! That's a good thing. A ghost who bleeds is less dangerous.' He grinned. "'Raoul! Raoul! Raoul!' The Count was shaking him, as though he were trying to waken a sleepwalker. "'But, my dear brother, I am not asleep,' Raoul protested impatiently. "'You can see the blood for yourself. 
I thought I had been dreaming and firing at two stars. It was Eric's eyes, and here is his blood. After all, perhaps I was wrong to shoot, and Christine is quite capable of never forgiving me. All this would not have happened if I had drawn the curtains before going to bed. Raoul, have you suddenly gone mad? Wake up! What still? You would do better to help me find Eric, for after all, a ghost who bleeds can always be found. The Count's valet said, That is so, sir, there is blood on the balcony. The other man-servant brought a lamp, by the light of which they examined the balcony carefully. The marks of blood followed the rail till they reached a gutter-spout. Then they went up the gutter-spout. "'My dear fellow,' said the Count Philippe, "'you have fired at a cat.' "'The misfortune is,' said Raoul, with a grin, "'that it's quite possible. "'With Eric you never know. "'Is it Eric? "'Is it the cat? "'Is it the ghost? "'No, with Eric you can't tell.' Raoul went on making the strange sort of remarks which corresponded so intimately and logically with the preoccupation of his brain, and which at the same time tended to persuade many people that his mind was unhinged. The Count himself was seized with this idea, and later the examining magistrate, on receiving the report of the commissary of police, came to the same conclusion. "'Who is Eric?' asked the Count, pressing his brother's hand. "'He is my rival, and if he's not dead, it's a pity.' He dismissed the servants with a wave of the hand, and the two shinies were left alone. But the men were not out of earshot before the Count's valet heard Raoul say, distinctly and emphatically, "'I shall carry off Christine Day to-night.' This phrase was afterward repeated to Mr. Farr, the examining magistrate. But no one ever knew exactly what passed between the two brothers at this interview. The servants declared that this was not their first quarrel. Their voices penetrated the wall, and it was always an actress called Christine Day that was in question. At breakfast, the early morning breakfast which the Count took in his study, Philippe sent for his brother. Raoul arrived silent and gloomy. The scene was a very short one. Philippe handed his brother a copy of the Epoch and said, Read that! The Viscount read, the latest news in the Faubourg is that there is a promise of marriage between Mademoiselle Christine Day, the opera singer, and Mr. Le Vicomte Raoul de Chagny. If the gossips are to be credited, Count Philippe has sworn that, for the first time on record, the Chagny's shall not keep their promise. But as love is all-powerful, at the opera, as, and even more than, elsewhere, we wonder how Count Philippe intends to prevent the Viscount, his brother, from leading the new Margarita to the altar. The two brothers are said to adore each other, but the Count is curiously mistaken if he imagines that brotherly love will triumph over love pure and simple. "'You see, Raoul,' said the Count, "'you are making us ridiculous. That little girl has turned your head with her ghost stories.' The Viscount had evidently repeated Christine's narrative to his brother during the night. All that he now said was, Good-bye, Philippe. Have you quite made up your mind? You are going to-night with her? No reply. Surely you will not do anything so foolish. I shall know how to prevent you. Good-bye, Philippe, said the Viscount again, and left the room. This scene was described to the examining magistrate by the Count himself, who did not see Raoul again until that evening, at the opera a few minutes before Christine's disappearance. Raoul, in fact, devoted the whole day to his preparations for the flight. The horses, the carriage, the coachman, the provisions, the luggage, the money required for the journey, the road to be taken, he had resolved not to go by train so as to throw the ghost off the scent. All this had to be settled and provided for, and it occupied him until nine o'clock at night. At nine o'clock a sort of travelling barouche with the curtains of its windows closed down, took its place in the rank of the rotunda side. It was drawn by two powerful horses driven by a coachman, whose face was almost concealed in the long folds of a muffler. In front of this travelling carriage were three brugums, belonging respectively to Carlotta, who had suddenly returned to Paris, to Sorelli, and, at the head of the rank, to Comte Philippe de Chagny. No one left the barouche. 
the coachman remained on his box, and the three other coachmen remained on theirs. A shadow in a long black cloak and a soft black felt hat passed along the pavement between the rotunda and the carriages, examined the barouche carefully, went up to the horses and the coachman, and then moved away without saying a word. The magistrate afterwards believed that this shadow was that of the Vicomte Raoul de Chagny, but I do not agree, seeing that that evening, as every evening, the Vicomte de Chagny was wearing a tall hat, which hat, besides, was subsequently found. I am more inclined to think that the shadow was that of the ghost, who knew all about the whole affair, as the reader will soon perceive. They were giving Faust, as it happened, before a splendid house. The Faubourg was magnificently represented, and the paragraph in that morning's epoch had already produced its effect, for all eyes were turned to the box in which Count Philippe sat alone, apparently in a very indifferent and careless frame of mind. The feminine element in the brilliant audience seemed curiously puzzled, and the Viscount's absence gave rise to any amount of whispering behind the fans. Christine Day met with a rather cold reception. That special audience could not forgive her for aiming so high. The singer noticed this unfavorable attitude of a portion of the house, and was confused by it. The regular frequenters of the opera, who pretended to know the truth about the Viscount's love story, exchanged significant smiles at certain passages in Margarita's part, and they made a show of turning and looking at Philippe de Chagny's box when Christine sang. I wish I could but know who was he that addressed me, if he was noble, or at least what his name is. The Count sat with his chin on his hand, and seemed to pay no attention to these manifestations. He kept his eyes fixed on the stage, but his thoughts appeared to be far away. Christine lost her self-assurance more and more. She trembled. She felt on the verge of a breakdown. Carolus Fonta wondered if she was ill, if she could keep the stage until the end of the garden act. In the front of the house, people remembered the catastrophe that had befallen Carlotta at the end of that act and the historic coac which had momentarily interrupted her career in Paris. Just then, Carlotta made her entrance in a box facing the stage. A sensational entrance. Poor Christine raised her eyes upon this fresh subject of excitement. She recognized her rival. She thought she saw a sneer on her lips. That saved her. She forgot everything in order to triumph once more. From that moment the prima donna sang with all her heart and soul. She tried to surpass all that she had done till then, and she succeeded. In the last act, when she began the invocation to the angels, she made all the members of the audience feel as though they, too, had wings. In the center of the amphitheater, a man stood up and remained standing, facing the singer. It was Raoul. Holy angel in heaven blessed, and Christine, her arms outstretched, her throat filled with music, the glory of her hair falling over her bare shoulders, uttered the divine cry. My spirit longs with thee to rest. It was at that moment that the stage was suddenly plunged in darkness. It happened so quickly that the spectators hardly had time to utter a sound of stupefaction, for the gas at once lit up the stage again. But Christine Day was no longer there. What had become of her? What was that miracle? All exchanged glances without understanding, and the excitement at once reached its height. Nor was the tension any less great on the stage itself. Men rushed from the wings to the spot where Christine had been singing that very instant. The performance was interrupted amid the greatest disorder. Where had Christine gone? What witchcraft had snatched her away before the eyes of thousands of enthusiastic onlookers and from the arms of Carolus Fonta himself? It was as though the angels had really carried her up to rest. Raoul, still standing up in the amphitheatre, had uttered a cry. Count Philippe had sprung to his feet in his box. People looked at the stage, at the Count, at Raoul, and wondered if this curious event was connected in any way with the paragraph in that morning's paper. But Raoul hurriedly left his seat, 
the Count disappeared from his box, and while the curtain was lowered, the subscribers rushed to the door that led behind the scenes. The rest of the audience waited amid an indescribable hubbub. Everyone spoke at once. Everyone tried to suggest an explanation of the extraordinary incident. At last, the curtain rose slowly, and Carolus Fanta stepped to the conductor's desk, and in a sad and serious voice said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, an unprecedented event has taken place, and thrown us into a state of the greatest alarm. Our sister artist, Christine Day, has disappeared before our eyes, and nobody can tell us how. End of chapter 13 of The Phantom of the Opera The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux Chapter 14 The Singular Attitude of a Safety Pin Behind the curtain there was an indescribable crowd. Artists, scene-shifters, dancers, supers, choristers, subscribers were all asking questions, shouting and hustling one another. What became of her? She's run away. With the Vicomte de Chagny, of course. No, with the Count. Ah, here's Carlotta. Carlotta did the trick. No, it was the ghost. And a few laughed, especially as a careful examination of the trap-doors and boards had put the idea of an accident out of the question. Amid this noisy throng, three men stood talking in a low voice and with despairing gestures. They were Gabriel, the chorus-master, Mercier, the acting-manager, and Rémy, the secretary. They retired to a corner of the lobby by which the stage communicates, with the wide passage leading to the foyer of the ballet. Here they stood and argued behind some enormous properties. "'I knocked at the door,' said Rémy. "'They did not answer. Perhaps they are not in their offices.' In any case, it's impossible to find out, for they took the keys with them. They were obviously the managers, who had given orders during the last entr'acte that they were not to be disturbed on any pretext whatever. They were not in to anybody. All the same, exclaimed Gabrielle, a singer isn't run away with from the middle of the stage every day. Did you shout that to them? asked Mercier. I'll go back again, said Rémy, and disappeared at a run. Thereupon the stage manager arrived. "'Well, Monsieur Mercier, are you coming? "'What are you two doing here? "'You are wanted, Monsieur Acting Manager.' "'I refuse to do anything or to know anything "'before the commissary arrives,' declared Mercier. "'I have sent me froid. "'We shall see when he comes. "'And I tell you that you ought to go down to the organ at once, "'not before the commissary comes. "'I've been down to the organ myself already. "'Ah, and what did you see?' "'Well, I saw nobody, do you hear? Nobody. "'What do you want me to do down there?' "'You're right,' said the stage manager, "'frantically pushing his hands through his rebellious hair. "'You're right, but there might be someone at the organ "'who could tell us how the stage came to suddenly be darkened. "'Now Mauclair is not to be found. Do you understand that?' "'Mauclair was the gas-man who dispensed day and night at will "'on the stage of the opera. "'Mauclair is not to be found,' repeated Mercier, taken aback. "'Well, what about his assistance?' "'There's no Mauclair and no assistance. "'No one at the lights, I tell you. "'You can imagine,' roared the stage manager, "'that the little woman must have been carried off by somebody. "'She didn't run away by herself. "'It was a calculated stroke, and we have to find out about it. "'And what are the managers doing all this time? "'I say I gave orders that no one was to go down to the lights, "'and I posted a fireman in front of the gas man's box beside the organ. "'Wasn't that right?' "'Yes, yes, quite right, quite right. "'And now let's wait for the commissary.' "'The stage manager walked away, shrugging his shoulders, "'fuming, muttering insults at those milksops "'who remained quietly squatting in a corner "'while the whole theatre was topsy-turvy. "'Gabriel and Mercier were not so quiet as all that. "'Only they had received an order that paralyzed them. "'The managers were not to be disturbed on any account. "'Rémy had violated that order and met with no success.' At that moment he returned from his new expedition, wearing a curiously startled air. "'Well, have you seen them?' asked Mercier. Montcharmin opened the door at last. His eyes were starting out of his head. I thought he meant to strike me. I could not get a word in, and what do you think he shouted to me? "'Have you a safety-pin? No. Well, then clear out!' I tried to tell him that an extraordinary thing had happened on the stage, but he roared. 
"'A safety pin! Give me a safety pin at once!' A boy heard him. He was bellowing like a bull, ran up with a safety pin and gave it to him. Whereupon Montcharmin slammed the door in my face, and there you are. "'And you couldn't have said, Christine Daillet? "'I should like to have seen you in my place.' He was foaming at the mouth. He thought of nothing but a safety pin. I believe if they hadn't brought him one, he would have fallen down in a fit. "'Oh, all well, that isn't normal, and our managers are going mad. "'Besides, I can't go on like this. "'I'm not used to being treated in that fashion.' Suddenly Gabriel whispered, "'It's another trick of O.G.'s.' Rémy gave a grin, Mercier sighed, and seemed about to speak, but meeting Gabriel's eyes said nothing. However, Mercier felt his responsibility increase, as the minutes passed without the manager's appearing, and at last he could stand it no longer. "'Look here, I'll go and hunt them out myself.' Gabriel, turning very gloomy and serious, stopped him. "'Be careful what you're doing, Mercier. "'If they're staying in their office, it's probably because they've got to. "'O.G. has more than one trick in his bag.' "'But Mercier shook his head. "'That's their lookout. I'm going. "'If people had listened to me, the police would have known everything long ago.' "'And he went. "'What's everything?' asked Rémy. "'What was there to tell the police? Why don't you answer, Gabriel?' "'Ah, so you know something. "'Well, you'd do better to tell me, too, if you don't want me to shout out that you are all going mad. Yet. "'Yes, that's what you are, mad.' Gabriel put on a stupid look, and pretended not to understand the private secretary's unseemly outburst. "'What something am I supposed to know?' he said. "'I don't know what you mean.' Rémy began to lose his temper. "'This evening Richard and Montcharmin were behaving like lunatics, here between the acts.' "'I never noticed it,' growled Gabriel, very much annoyed." "'Then you're the only one. Do you think that I didn't see them, and that M. Parabrise, the manager of the Crédit Central, noticed nothing, and that M. de la Borderie, the ambassador, has no eyes to see with? Why, all the subscribers were pointing at our managers.' "'But what were our managers doing?' asked Gabriel, putting on his most innocent air. "'What were they doing? You know better than any one else what they were doing. You were there, and you were watching them, you and Mercier, and you were the only two who didn't laugh.' "'I don't understand.' Gabriel raised his arms and dropped them to his side again, which gesture was meant to convey that the question did not interest him in the least. Rémy continued, "'What is the sense of this new mania of theirs? Why won't they have any one come near them now?' "'What?' Won't they have anyone come near them? And they won't let anyone touch them. Really? Have you noticed that they won't let anyone touch them? That is certainly odd. Oh, so you admit it. And high time, too. And then they walk backwards. Backwards? You have seen our managers walk backwards? Why, I thought that only crabs walked backwards. Don't laugh, Gabriel. Don't laugh. I'm not laughing, protested Gabriel, looking as solemn as a judge. "'Perhaps you can tell me this, Gabriel, as you're an intimate friend of the management. "'When I went up to Monsieur Richard outside the foyer during the garden interval, "'with my hand out before me, why did Monsieur Montcharmin whisper to me, "'Go away, go away, whatever you do, don't touch Monsieur le directeur. "'Am I supposed to have an infectious disease?' "'It's incredible.' and a little later when m de la borderie went up to m richard didn't you see m montcharmin fling himself between them and hear him exclaim m l'ambassadeur i entreat you not to touch m le directeur it's terrible and what was richard doing meanwhile what was he doing why you saw him he turned about bowed in front of him though there was nobody in front of him and withdrew backwards backwards and montcharmin behind richard also turned about that is he described a semicircle behind richard and also walked backwards and they went like that to the staircase leading to the manager's office backwards 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 well if they are not mad will you explain what it means perhaps they were practising a figure in the ballet suggested gabriel without much conviction in his voice the secretary was furious at this wretched joke made at so dramatic a moment he knit his brows and compressed his lips. Then he put his mouth to Gabriel's ear. "'Don't be so sly, Gabriel. There are things going on for which you and Merci are partially responsible.' "'What do you mean?' asked Gabriel. "'Christine Daya is not the only one who suddenly disappeared tonight.' "'Oh, nonsense!' "'There's no nonsense about it. 
Perhaps you can tell me why, when Mother Giry came down to the foyer just now, Mercier took her by the hand and hurried her away with him. Really? said Gabriel. I never saw it. You did see it, Gabriel, for you went with Mercier and Mother Giry to Mercier's office. Since then you and Mercier have been seen, but no one has seen Mother Giry. Do you think we've eaten her? No, but you've locked her up in the office, and any one passing the office can hear her yelling. Oh, the scoundrels! Oh, the scoundrels! At this point of that singular conversation, Mercier arrived all out of breath. There, he said in a gloomy voice, it's worse than ever. I shouted, it's a serious matter. Open the door. It's I, Mercier. I heard footsteps. The door opened, and Moncharmin appeared. He was very pale. He said, What do you want? I answered, Someone has run off with Christine Daye. What do you think he said? And a good job, too. And he shut the door after putting this in my hand. Mercier opened his hand. Remy and Gabriel looked. The safety pin, cried Remy. Strange, strange, muttered Gabriel, who could not help shivering. Suddenly a voice made them all three turn round. I beg your pardon, gentlemen, but could you tell me where Kristen Daye is? In spite of the serious circumstances, the absurdity of the question would have made them roar with laughter, if they had not caught sight of a face so sorrow-stricken that they were at once seized with pity. It was the Vicomte Raoul de Chagny. End of chapter 14「The Phantom of the Opera」by Gaston Leroux Chapter 15 – Christine, Christine Raoul's first thought after Christine Daae's fantastic disappearance was to accuse Eric. He no longer doubted the almost supernatural powers of the Angel of Music in this domain of the opera in which he had set up his empire. And Raoul rushed on the stage in a mad fit of love and despair. Christine! Christine! he moaned, calling to her as he felt that she must be calling to him from the depths of that dark pit to which the monster had carried her. Christine! Christine! And he seemed to hear the girl's screams through the frail boards that separated him from her. He bent forward, he listened. He wandered over the stage like a madman. Ah, to descend, to descend into that pit of darkness, every entrance to which was closed to him, for the stairs that led below the stage were forbidden to one and all that night. Christine! Christine! People pushed him aside, laughing. They made fun of him. They thought the poor lover's brain was gone. By what mad road, through what passages of mystery and darkness known to him alone, had Eric's dragged that pure-souled child to the awful haunt with the Louis-Philippe room opening out on the lake? Christine! Christine! Why don't you answer? Are you alive? Hideous thoughts flashed through Raoul's congested brain. Of course, Eric must have discovered their secret, must have known that Christine had played him false what a vengeance would be his. And Raoul thought again of the yellow stairs that had come the night before and roamed over his balcony. Why had he not put them out for good? There were some men's eyes that dilated in the darkness and shone like stars or like cats' eyes, certainly albinos who seemed to have rabbits' eyes by day and had cats' eyes at night. Everybody knew that. Yes. Yes, he had undoubtedly fired at Eric. Why had he not killed him? The monster had fled up the gutter spout like a cat or a convict who, everybody knew that also, would scale the very skies with the help of a gutter spout. No doubt Eric was at that time contemplating some decisive step against Raoul. But he had been wounded and had escaped to turn against poor Christine and said, such were the cruel thoughts that haunted Raoul as he ran to the singer's dressing room. Christine! Christine! Bitter tears scorched the boy's eyelids as he saw scattered over the furniture the clothes which his beautiful bride was to have worn at the hour of their flight. Oh, why had she refused to leave earlier? Why had she toyed with the threatening catastrophe? 
Why toyed with the monster's heart? Why, in a final excess of pity, had she insisted on flinging, as a last sop, to that demon's soul, her divine song? Holy angel, in heaven blessed, my spirit longs with thee to rest. Raoul, his throat filled with sobs, oaths, and insults, fumbled awkwardly at the great mirror that had opened one night before his eyes to let Christine pass to the murky dwelling below. He pushed, pressed, groped about, but the glass apparently obeyed no one but Eric. Perhaps actions were not enough with a glass of the kind. Perhaps he was expected to utter certain words. When he was a little boy, he had heard that there were things that obeyed the spoken word. Suddenly, Ralph remembered something about a gate opening into the Rue Scribe, an underground passage running straight to the Rue Scribe from the lake. Yes, Christine had told him about that. And, when he found that the key was no longer in the box, he nevertheless ran to the Rue Scribe. Outside in the street, he passed his trembling hands over the huge stones, felt for outlets, met with iron bars. Were those they, or these, or could it be that air hole? He plunged his useless eyes through the bars. How dark it was in there. He listened. All was silence. He went round the building and came to bigger bars, immense gates. It was the entrance to the Cour de l'Administration. Raoul rushed into the doorkeeper's lodge. I beg your pardon, madame. Could you tell me where to find a gate or door made of bars, iron bars, opening into the Rue Scribe and leading to the lake? You know the lake, I mean? Yes, the underground lake, under the opera. Yes, sir, I know there is a lake under the opera, but I don't know which door it leads to it. I have never been there. And the Rue Scribe, madame, the Rue Scribe. Have you ever been to the Rue Scribe? The woman laughed, screamed with laughter. Raoul darted away, roaring with laughter, ran upstairs, four stairs at a time. Downstairs, rushed through the, through the whole of the business side of the opera house, found himself once more in the light of the stage. He stopped with his heart thumping in his chest. Suppose Christine Dailly had been found. He saw a group of men and asked, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Could you tell me where Christine Daae is? And somebody laughed. At the same moment, the stage buzzed with a new sound, and amid a crowd of men in evening dress, all talking and gesticulating together, appeared a man who seemed very calm and displayed a pleasant face, all pink and chubby-cheeked, crowned with curly hair and lit up by a pair of wonderfully serene blue eyes. Mercier, the acting manager, called the Vicomte de Chagny's attention to him and said, This is the gentleman to whom you should put your question, monsieur. Let me introduce Mifroid, the commissionary of police. Ah, M. le Vicomte de Chagny. Delighted to meet you, monsieur, said the commissary. Would you mind coming with me? And now, where are the managers? Where are the managers? Mercier did not answer, and Remy, the secretary, volunteered the information that the managers were locked up in their office, and that they knew nothing as yet of what had happened. You don't mean to say so. Let us go up to the office. And M. Mifroid, followed by an ever-increasing crowd, turned toward the business side of the building. Mercier took advantage of the confusion to slip a key into Gabriel's hand. This is all going very badly, he whispered. You had better let Mother Giry out. And Gabriel moved away. They soon came to the manager's door. Mercier stormed in vain. The door remained closed. Open in the name of the law, commanded M. Mifroid in a loud and rather anxious voice. At last the doors opened. All rushed into the office, on the commissary's heels. Raoul was the last to enter. As he was about to follow the rest into the room, a hand was laid on his shoulder, and he heard these words spoken in his ear. Eric's secrets concern no one but himself. He turned around with a stifled exclamation. The hand that was laid on his shoulder was now placed on the lips of a person with an ebony skin, 
with eyes of jade and with an astrakhan cap on his head. The Persian! The stranger kept up the gesture that recommended discretion, and then, at the moment when the astonished Viscount was about to ask the reason of his mysterious intervention, bowed and disappeared. End of chapter 15《Phantom of the Opera》by Gaston Leroux。《Phantom 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 of the Opera》by Gaston Leroux which Reni and Mercier had vainly tried to enter, and to which Messieurs Richard and Montcharmin had locked themselves, with an object which the reader does not yet know, which it is my duty, as a historian, to reveal without further postponement. I have had occasion to say that the manager's mood had undergone a disagreeable change for some time past, and to convey the fact that this change was due not only to the fall of the chandelier, on the famous night of the gala performance. The reader must know that the ghost had calmly been paid his first twenty thousand francs. Oh, there had been wailing and gnashing of teeth indeed, and yet the thing had happened as simply as could be. One morning the managers found on their table an envelope addressed to Monsieur Rogi, private, and accompanied by a note from Rogi himself. The time has come to carry out the clause in the memorandum book. Please put twenty notes of ten thousand francs into this envelope, seal it with your own seal, and hand it to Madame Gurry, who will do what is necessary. The managers did not hesitate. Without wasting time in asking how these confounded communications came to be, delivered in an office which they were careful to keep locked, They seized this opportunity of laying hands on the mysterious blackmailer, and, after telling the whole story, under the promise of secrecy, the Gabriel Mercier, they put the twenty thousand francs into the envelope, and without asking for explanations, handed it to Madame Gurry, who had been reinstated in her functions. The box keeper displayed no astonishment. I need hardly say that she was well watched. She went straight to the ghost box and placed the precious envelope on the little shelf attached to the ledge. The two managers, as well as Gabrielle and Mercier, were hidden in such a way that they did not lose sight of the envelope for a second during the long performance, and even afterward, for as the envelope had not moved, those who watched. Did not move either, and Madame Gurry went away while the managers, Gabriel and Mercier, were still there. At last, they became tired of waiting and opened the envelope, after ascertaining that the seals had not been broken. At first sight, Richard and Montcharmin thought that the notes were still there, but soon they perceived that they were not the same. The twenty real notes were gone and had been replaced by twenty notes of the Bank of Saint Fars. Footnote: Flash notes drawn on the Bank of Saint Fars in France correspond with those drawn on the Bank of Engraving in England. Translator's note. End footnote. The manager's rage and fright were unmistakable. Montcharmin wanted to send for the commissary of police, but Richard objected. He no doubt had a plan, for he said, "Don't let us make ourselves ridiculous. All Paris would laugh at us. O. G. has won the first game. We will win the second. He was thinking of the next month's allowance. Nevertheless, they had been so absolutely tricked." That they were bound to suffer a certain dejection, and upon my word, it was not difficult to understand. We must not forget that the managers had an idea at the back of their minds all the time, 
that this strange incident might be an unpleasant practical joke on the part of their predecessors, and that it would not do to divulge it prematurely. On the other hand, Moncharmin was sometimes troubled with the suspicion of Richard himself, who occasionally took fanciful whims into his head, and so they were content to await events while keeping an eye on Mother Gary. Richard would not have her spoken to. If she is a confederate, he said, the notes are gone long ago. But, in my opinion, she is merely an idiot. She's not the only idiot in this business, said Moncharmin pensively. Well, who could have thought it, moaned Richard. But don't be afraid. Next time I shall have taken my precautions. The next time fell on the same day that beheld the disappearance of Christine Day. In the morning, a note from the ghost reminded them that the money was due. It read, Do just as you did last time. It went very well. Put the twenty thousand in the envelope and hand it to our excellent Madame Gurry. And the note was accompanied by the usual envelope. They had only to insert the notes. This was done about a half an hour before the curtain rose on the first act of Faust. The shard showed the envelope to Ma Charmin. Then he counted the twenty thousand franc notes in front of him and put the notes into the envelope, but without closing it. And now, he said, let's have Mother Gurry in. The old woman was sent for. She entered with a sweeping curtsy. She still wore her black taffeta dress, the color of which was rapidly turning to rust and lilac, to say nothing of the dingy bonnet. She seemed in a good temper. She at once said, Good evening, gentlemen. It's for the envelope, I suppose. Yes, Madame Gurry, said Richard most amiably, for the envelope, and something else besides. At your service, Monsieur Richard, at your service. And what is that something else, please? First of all, Madame Gurry, I have a little question to put to you. By all means, Monsieur Richard, Madame Gurry is here to answer you. Are you still on good terms with the ghost? Couldn't be better, sir, couldn't be better. Ah, we are delighted. Look here, Madame Gurry, said Richard, in the tone of making an important confidence. We may just as well tell you among ourselves, you're no fool. Why, sir, exclaimed the box keeper, stopping the pleasant nodding of the black feathers in her dingy bonnet, I assure you, no one has ever doubted that. We are quite agreed, and we shall soon understand one another. The story of the ghost is all humbug, isn't it? Well, still, between ourselves, it has lasted long enough. Madame Gurry looked at the managers as though they were talking Chinese. She walked up to Richard's table and asked rather anxiously, What do you mean? I don't understand. Oh, you understand quite well. In any case, you've got to understand. And first of all, tell us his name. Whose name? The name of the man whose accomplice you are, Madame Gurry. I am the ghost's accomplice? I? His accomplice in what, pray? You do all he wants. Oh, he's not very troublesome, you know. And does he still tip you? I mustn't complain. How much does he give you for bringing him that envelope? Ten francs. You poor thing. That's not much, is it? Why? I'll tell you that presently, Madame Gurry. Just now, we should like to know for what extraordinary reason you have given yourself body and soul to this ghost. Madame Gurry's friendship and devotion are not to be bought for five francs or ten francs. That's true enough, and I can tell you the reason, sir. There's no disgrace about it. On the contrary, we're quite sure of that, Madame Gurry. Well, it's like this. Only the ghost doesn't like me to talk about his business. Indeed, sneered Richard. 
but this is a matter that concerns myself alone. Well, it was in box five one evening. I found a letter addressed to myself, a sort of note written in red ink. I needn't read the letter to you, sir. I know it by heart, and I shall never forget it if I live to be a hundred. And Madame Gurry, drawing herself up, recited the letter with touching eloquence. Madame, 1825, Mademoiselle Menetrier, leader of the ballet, became Marquis de Cusy, 1832, Mademoiselle Marie Talegonier, a dancer, became Comtesse Gilbert de Voisin, 1846, La Sota, a dancer, married a brother of the King of Spain, 1847, Lola Monte, a dancer, became the morganic wife of King Louis of Bavaria, and was created Countess of Lansfeld. 1848, Mademoiselle Maria, a dancer, became Barone de Hedenville. 1870, Teresa Hessier, a dancer, married Dom Fernando, brother to the King of Portugal. Brichard and Montcharmin listened to the old woman, who, as she proceeded with the enumeration of these glorious nuptials, swelled out, took courage, and at last, in a voice bursting with pride, flung out the last sentence of the prophetic letter. 1885. Meg Gurry, Empress. Exhausted by the supreme effort, the box-keeper fell into a chair, saying, "'Gentlemen, the letter was signed Opera Ghost. I had heard much of the ghost, but only half believed in him. From the day when he declared that my little Meg, the flesh of my flesh, the fruit of my womb, would be empress, I believed in him altogether. And really, it was not necessary to make a long study of Madame Guéry's excited features to understand— what could be God of that fine intellect, with the two words, ghost and empress? But who pulled the strings of that extraordinary puppet? That was the question. You have never seen him. He speaks to you, and you believe all he says, asked Montcharmin. Yes. To begin with, I owe it to him that my little Meg was promoted to the leader of a row. I said to the ghost— if she is to be empress in 1885, there is no time to lose. She must become a leader at once. He said, look upon it as done. And he had only a word to say to Monsieur Poligny, and the thing was done. So you say that Monsieur Poligny saw him? No, not any more than I did. But he heard him. The ghost said a word in his ear, you know, on the evening when he left Box 5, looking so dreadfully pale. Montcharmin heaved a sigh. "'What a business!' he groaned. "'Ah!' said Madame Gurry. "'I always thought there were secrets between the ghost and Monsieur Poligny. "'Anything the ghost asked Monsieur Poligny to do, Monsieur Poligny did. "'Monsieur Poligny could refuse the ghost nothing.' "'You hear, Richard? "'Poligny could refuse the ghost nothing.' "'Yes, yes, I hear,' said Richard. Monsieur Poligny is a friend of the ghost, and, as Madame Gurry is a friend of Monsieur Poligny, there we are. But I don't care a hang about Monsieur Poligny, he added roughly. The only person whose fate really interests me is Madame Gurry. Madame Gurry, do you know what is in this envelope? Why, of course not, she said. Well, look. Madame Gurry looked into the envelope with a lacklustre eye, which soon recovered its brilliancy. Thousand franc notes, she cried. Yes, Madame Gurry, thousand franc notes, and you knew it. I, sir? I? I swear. Don't swear, Madame Gurry, and now I will tell you the second reason why I sent for you. Madame Gurry, I am going to have you arrested. The two black feathers on the dingy bonnet, which usually affected the attitude of two notes of interrogation, changed into two notes of exclamation. 
As for the bonnet itself, it swayed in menace on the old lady's temptuous chignon. Surprise, indignation, protest, and dismay were furthermore displayed by little Meg's mother in a sort of extravagant movement of offended virtue, half bound, half sly, that brought her right under the nose of Monsieur Richard, who could not help pushing back his chair. Have me arrested! The mouth that spoke these words seemed to spit the three teeth that were left to it into Richard's face. Monsieur Richard behaved like a hero. He retreated no further. His threatening forefinger seemed already to be pointing out the keeper of Box 5 to the absent magistrates. I am going to have you arrested, Madame Gurry, as a thief. Say that again. And Madame Gurry caught Mr. Manager Richard a mighty box on the ear before Mr. Manager Moncharmin had time to intervene. But it was not the withered hand of the angry old beldame that fell on the managerial ear, but the envelope itself, the cause of all the trouble, the magic envelope that opened with the blow, scattering the banknotes, which escaped in a fantastic whirl of giant butterflies. The two managers gave a shout, and the same thought made them both go on their knees, feverishly. "'picking up and hurriedly examining the precious scraps of paper. "'Are they still genuine, mon cher Charmin? "'Are they still genuine, Richard? "'Yes, they are still genuine.' "'Above their heads, Madame Gurry's three teeth were clashing in a noisy contest "'full of hideous interjections. "'But all that could be clearly distinguished was this liet motif. "'I, a thief!' I, a thief, I! She choked with rage. She shouted, I have never heard of such a thing. And suddenly she darted up to Richard again. In any case, she yelped, You, Monsieur Richard, ought to know better than I where the twenty thousand francs went to. I, asked Richard, astonished, and how should I know? Ma Charmin, looking severe and dissatisfied, at once insisted that the good lady should explain herself. What does this mean, Madame Gurry? he asked, and why do you say that Monsieur Richard ought to know better than you where the twenty thousand francs went to? As for Richard, who felt himself turning red under Ma Charmin's eyes, he took Madame Gurry by the wrist and shook it violently. In a voice growling and rolling like thunder, he roared, Why should I know better than you where the twenty thousand francs went to? Why? Answer me! Because they went into your pocket, gasped the old woman, looking at him as if he were the devil incarnate. Richard would have rushed upon Madame Gurry if Moncharmin had not stayed his avenging hand and hastened to ask her more gently. How can you suspect my partner, Monsieur Richard, of putting twenty thousand francs in his pocket? I never said that, declared Madame Gurry, seeing that it was myself who put the twenty thousand francs into Monsieur Richard's pocket. And she added, under her voice, There, it's out, and may the ghost forgive me. Richard began bellowing anew, but Montcharmin authoritatively ordered him to be silent. Allow me, allow me, let the woman explain herself, let me question her. And he added, It is really astonishing that you should take up such a tone. We are on the verge of clearing up the whole mystery, and you're in a rage. You're wrong to behave like that. I'm enjoying myself immensely. Madame Gurry, like the martyr that she was, raised her head, her face beaming with faith in her own innocence. You tell me there were twenty thousand francs in the envelope which I put into Monsieur Richard's pocket, but I tell you again that I knew nothing about it, nor Monsieur Richard either, for that matter. Aha! said Richard, suddenly assuming a swaggering air which Moncharmin did not like. I knew nothing either. You put twenty thousand francs in my pocket, 
and I knew nothing either. I am very glad to hear it, Madame Gurry. Yes, the terrible dame agreed. Yes, it's true. We neither of us knew anything, but you, you must have ended by finding out. Richard would certainly have swallowed Madame Gurry alive if Moncharmin had not been there. But Moncharmin protected her. He resumed his questions. What sort of envelope did you put in Monsieur Richard's pocket? It was not the one which we gave you, the one which you took to box five before our eyes, and yet that was the one which contained the twenty thousand francs. I beg your pardon. The envelope which Monsieur le Directeur gave me was the one which I slipped into Monsieur le Directeur's pocket, explained Madame Gurry. The one which I took to the ghost box was another envelope. Just like it, which the ghost gave me beforehand, and which I hid up my sleeve. So saying, Madame Gurry took from her sleeve an envelope, ready prepared and similarly addressed to that containing the twenty thousand francs. The managers took it from her. They examined it and saw that it was fastened with seals, stamped with their own managerial seal. They opened it. It contained twenty Bank of St. Farce notes. Like those which had so much astounded them the month before. How simple, said Richard. How simple, repeated Moncharmin, and he continued with his eyes fixed upon Madame Gurry, as though trying to hypnotize her. So, it was the ghost who gave you this envelope and told you to substitute it for the one which we gave you, and it was the ghost who told you to put the other into Monsieur Richard's pocket. Yes, it was the ghost. Then would you mind giving us a specimen of your little talents? Here is the envelope. Act as though we knew nothing. As you please, gentlemen. Madame Gurry took the envelope with the twenty notes inside it and made for the door. She was on the point of going out when the two managers rushed at her. Oh, no, oh, no, we're not going to be done a second time, once bitten, twice shy. I beg your pardon, gentlemen, said the old woman in self excuse. You told me to act as though you knew nothing. Well, if you knew nothing, I should go away with the envelope. And then how would you slip it into my pocket? argued Richard, whom Moncharmin fixed with his left eye, while keeping his right on Madame Gurry, a proceeding likely to strain his sight. But Moncharmin was prepared to go to any length to discover the truth. I am to slip it into your pocket when you least expect it, sir. You know that I always take a little turn behind the scenes in the course of the evening, and I often go with my daughter to the ballet foyer, which I am entitled to do as her mother. I bring her her shoes when the ballet is about to begin. In fact, I come and go as I please. The subscribers come and go, too. So do you, sir. There are lots of people about. I go behind you and slip the envelope into the tail pocket of your dress coat. There's no witchcraft about that. No witchcraft. Rolling his eyes like Jupiter Tonans. No witchcraft. Why, I've just caught you in a lie, you old witch. Madame Gurry bristled, with her three teeth sticking out of her mouth. And why, may I ask? Because I spent that evening watching box five in the sham envelope which you put there. I did not go to the ballet foyer for a second. No, sir, and I did not give you the envelope that evening, but at the next performance on the evening when the Under Secretary of State for Fine Arts. At these words, Monsieur Richard suddenly interrupted Madame Gurry. Yes. That's true, I remember now. The under secretary went behind the scenes. He asked for me. I went down to the ballet foyer for a moment. I was on the foyer steps. The under secretary and his chief clerk were in the foyer itself. I suddenly turned around. You had passed behind me, Madame Gure. You seemed to push against me. Oh, I can see you still. I can see you still. Yes, that's it, sir. That's it. I had just finished my little business. That pocket of yours, sir, is very handy. And Madame Gurry once more suited the action to the word. She passed behind Monsieur Richard, and so nimbly that Moncharmin himself was impressed by it, slipped the envelope into the pocket of one of the tails of Monsieur Richard's dress coat. 
"'Of course!' exclaimed Richard, looking a little pale. "'It's very clever of O.G. "'The problem which he had to solve was this. "'How to do away with any dangerous intermediary "'between the man who gives the twenty thousand francs "'and the man who receives it, "'and by far the best thing he could hit upon "'was to come and take the money from my pocket "'without my noticing it, "'as I myself did not know it was there.' "'It's wonderful!' "'Oh, wonderful, no doubt,' Moncharmin agreed. "'Only you forget, Richard, that I provided ten thousand francs of the twenty, "'and that nobody put anything in my pocket.'" End of chapter 16「The Phantom of the Opera」by Gaston Leroux Chapter 17 – The Safety Pin Again Moncharmin's last phrase so dearly expressed the suspicion in which he now held his partner that it was bound to cause a stormy explanation, at the end of which it was agreed that Richard should yield to all Moncharmin's wishes, with the object of helping him to discover the miscreant who was victimizing them. This brings us to the interval after the Garden Act, with the strange conduct observed by Monsieur Remy, and those curious lapses from the dignity that might be expected of the managers. It was arranged between Richard and Montremain, first, that Richard should repeat the exact movements which he had made on the night of the disappearance of the first twenty thousand francs, and second, that Montremain should not for an instant lose sight of Richard's coat-tail pocket, into which Madame Giry was to slip the twenty thousand francs. Monsieur Richard went and placed himself at the identical spot where he had stood when he bowed to the undersecretary for fine arts. Monsieur Montchamin took up his position a few steps behind him. Madame Giry passed, rubbed up against Monsieur Richard, got rid of her twenty thousand francs in the manager's coat-tail pocket, and disappeared. Or rather, she was conjured away. In accordance with the instructions received from Moncharmin a few minutes earlier, Mercier took the good lady to the acting manager's office and turned the key on her, thus making it impossible for her to communicate with her ghost. Meanwhile, Monsieur Richard was bending and bowing and scraping and walking backward, just as if he had that high and mighty minister, the under-secretary for fine arts, before him. Only, though these marks of politeness would have created no astonishment if the under-secretary of state had really been in front of Monsieur Richard, they caused an easily comprehensible amazement to the spectators of this very natural but quite inexplicable scene when Monsieur Richard had nobody in front of him. Monsieur Richard bowed to nobody, bent his back, before nobody, and walked backward, before nobody. And a few steps behind him, Monsieur Moncharmin did the same thing that he was doing, in addition to pushing away Monsieur Rémy and begging Monsieur de la Borderie, the ambassador, and the manager of the Credit Central, not to touch Monsieur le Directeur. Moncharmin, who had his own ideas, did not want Richard to come to him presently, when the twenty thousand francs were gone, and say, Perhaps it was the ambassador, or the manager of the Credit Central, or Remy. The more so as, at the time of the first scene, as Richard himself admitted, Richard had met nobody in that part of the theatre, after Madame Giry had brushed up against him. Having begun by walking backward in order to bow, Richard continued to do so from prudence, until he reached the passage leading to the offices of the management. In this way, he was constantly watched by Moncharmin from behind, and himself kept an eye on anyone approaching from the front. Once more, this novel method of walking behind the scenes, adopted by the managers of our National Academy of Music, attracted attention. But the managers themselves thought of nothing but their twenty thousand francs. On reaching the half-dark passage, Richard said to Moncharmin in a low voice, I am sure that nobody has touched me. 
you had now better keep at some distance from me, and watch till I come to the door of the office. It is better not to arouse suspicion, and we can see anything that happens. But Moonshaman replied, No, Richard, no. You walk ahead, and I'll walk immediately behind you. I won't leave you by a step. But in that case, exclaimed Richard, they will never steal our twenty thousand francs. I should hope not, indeed, declared Moncherman. Then what we are doing is absurd. We are doing exactly what we did last time. Last time, I joined you as you were leaving the stage and followed close behind you down this passage. That's true, sighed Richard, shaking his head and passively obeying Moncherman. Two minutes later, the joint managers locked themselves into their office. Moncherman himself put the key in his pocket. We remained locked up like this last time, he said, until you left the opera to go home. That's so. No one came and disturbed us, I suppose. No one. Then, said Richard, who was trying to collect his memory, then I must certainly have been robbed on my way home from the opera. No, said Moncharmont, in a drier tone than ever. No, that's impossible, for I dropped you in my cab. The twenty thousand francs disappeared at your place. There's not a shadow of a doubt about that. It's incredible, protested Richard. I am sure of my servants, and if one of them had done it, he would have disappeared since. Moncherman shrugged his shoulders, as though to say that he did not wish to enter into details, and Richard began to think that Moncherman was treating him in a very insupportable fashion. Moncherman, I've had enough of this. Richard, I've had too much of it. Do you dare to suspect me? Yes, of a silly joke. One doesn't joke with twenty thousand francs. That's what I think declared Moncherman, unfolding a newspaper and ostentatiously studying its contents. "'What are you doing?' asked Richard. "'Are you going to read the paper next?' "'Yes, Richard, until I take you home.' "'Like last time?' "'Yes, like last time.' Richard snatched the paper from Moncherman's hands. Moncherman stood up, more irritated than ever and found himself faced by an exasperated Richard, who, crossing his arms on his chest, said, Look here, I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking of what I might think if, like last time, after spending the evening alone with you, you brought me home, and if, at the moment of parting, I perceived that twenty thousand francs had disappeared from my coat pocket, like last time. And what might you think? asked Moncharmont, crimson with rage. I might think that as you hadn't left me by a foot's breath, and as, by your own wish, you were the only one to approach me like last time, I might think that if that twenty thousand francs was no longer in my pocket, it stood a very good chance of being in yours. Moncharmont leapt up at the suggestion. Oh, he shouted, a safety pin! What do you want a safety pin for? To fasten you up with. A safety pin! A safety pin! You want to fasten me with a safety pin? Yes, to fasten you to the twenty thousand francs. Then, whether it's here, or on the drive from here to your place, or at your place, you will feel the hand that pulls at your pocket, and you will see if it's mine. Oh, so you're suspecting me now, are you? A safety pin! And that was the moment when Moncharmont opened the door on the passage and shouted, A safety pin! Somebody give me a safety pin! And we also know how, at the same moment, Remy, who had no safety pin, was received by Moncharmont, while a boy procured the pin so eagerly longed for. And what happened was this. Moncharmont first locked the door again. Then he knelt down behind Richard's back. I hope, he said, that the notes are still there. So do I, said Richard. The real ones, asked Moncharmont, resolved not to be had this time. Look for yourself, 
said Richard. I refuse to touch them. Moncharmont took the envelope from Richard's pocket and drew out the banknotes with a trembling hand. For this time, in order frequently to make sure of the presence of the notes, he had not sealed the envelope nor even fastened it. He felt reassured on finding that they were all there and quite genuine. He put them back in the tail pocket and pinned them with great care. Then he sat down behind Richard's coat tails and kept his eyes fixed on them, while Richard, sitting at his writing table, did not stir. A little patience, Richard, said Moncharmon. We have only a few minutes to wait. The clock will soon strike twelve. Last time we left at the last stroke of twelve. Oh, I shall have all the patience necessary. The time passed, slow, heavy, mysterious, stifling. Richard tried to laugh. I shall end by believing in the omnipotence of the ghost, he said. Just now, don't you find something uncomfortable, disquieting, alarming in the atmosphere of this room? You're quite right, said Moncharmont, who was really impressed. The ghost, continued Richard, in a low voice, as though fearing lest he should be overheard by invisible ears. The ghost, suppose, all the same, it were a ghost who puts the magic envelopes on the table, who talks in box five, who killed Joseph Bouquet, who unhooked the chandelier, and who robs us. For, after all, after all, after all, there is no one here except you and me, and if the notes disappear, and neither you nor I have anything to do with it, well, we shall have to believe in the ghost, in the ghost. At that moment, the clock on the mantelpiece gave its warning click, and the first stroke of twelve struck. The two managers shuddered. The perspiration streamed from their foreheads. The twelfth stroke sounded strangely in their ears. When the clock stopped, they gave a sigh and rose from their chairs. I think we can go now, said Moncharmont. I think so, Richard agreed. Before we go, do you mind if I look in your pocket? But of course, Moncharmont, you must. Well, he asked, as Moncharmont was feeling at the pocket. Well, I can feel the pin. Of course, as you said, we can't be robbed without noticing it. But Moncharmont, whose hands were still fumbling, bellowed, I can feel the pin, but I can't feel the notes. Come, no joking, Moncharmont, this isn't the time for it. Well, feel for yourself. Richard tore off his coat. The two managers turned the pocket inside out. The pocket was empty. And the curious thing was that the pin remained, stuck in the same place. Richard and Moncharmont turned pale. There was no longer any doubt about the witchcraft. The ghost, muttered Moncharmont. But Richard suddenly sprang upon his partner. No one but you has touched my pocket. Give me back my twenty thousand francs. Give me back my twenty thousand francs. On my soul, sighed Moncharmont, who was ready to swoon. On my soul, I swear that I haven't got it. Then somebody knocked at the door. Moncharmont opened it automatically, seemed hardly to recognize Mercier, his business manager, exchanged a few words with him without knowing what he was saying, and with an unconscious movement put the safety pin, for which he had no further use, into the hands of his bewildered subordinate. End of chapter 17「The Phantom of the Opera » by Gaston Leroux Chapter 18 – The Commissary » the Viscount, and the Persian. The first words of the commissary of police on entering the manager's office were to ask after the missing prima donna. Is Christine Daae here? Christine Daae here? echoed Richard. No, why? As for Moncharmont, 
he had not the strength left to utter a word. Richard repeated, for the commissary and the compact crowd which had followed him into the office observed an impressive silence. Why do you ask if Christine Daae is here, Monsieur le Commissaire? Because she has to be found, declared the commissary of police solemnly. What do you mean, she has to be found? Has she disappeared? In the middle of the performance. In the middle of the performance? This is extraordinary. Isn't it? And what is quite as extraordinary is that you should first learn it from me. Yes, said Richard, taking his head in his hands and muttering, What is this new business? Oh, it's enough to make a man sent in his resignation. And he pulled a few hairs out of his moustache, without even knowing what he was doing. So she... So she disappeared in the middle of the performance, he repeated. Yes, she was carried off in the prison act at the moment when she was invoking the aid of the angels. But I doubt if she was carried off by an angel. And I am sure that she was. Everybody looked round. A young man, pale and trembling with excitement, repeated, I am sure of it. Sure of what? asked Mifoy. That Christine Daae was carried off by an angel, Monsieur le Commissaire, and I can tell you his name. Ah, Monsieur le Vicomte de Chagny. So you maintain that Christine Daae was carried off by an angel. An angel of the opera, no doubt. Yes, Monsieur, by an angel of the opera. And I will tell you where he lives, when we are alone. You are right, Monsieur. And the commissary of police, inviting Raoul to take a chair, cleared the room of all the rest, excepting the managers. Then Raoul spoke. Monsieur le commissaire, the angel is called Eric. He lives in the opera, and he is the angel of music. The angel of music. Really? That is very curious. The angel of music. And turning to the managers, Monsieur Mouffoy asked, Have you an angel of music on the premises, gentlemen? Richard and Moncharmont shook their heads without even speaking. Oh, said the Viscount, those gentlemen have heard of the opera ghost. Well, I am in a position to state that the opera ghost and the angel of music are one and the same person, and his real name is Eric. Monsieur Mouffoy rose and looked at Raoul attentively. I beg your pardon, monsieur, but is it your intention to make fun of the law? And if not, what is all this about the opera ghost? I say that these gentlemen have heard of him. Gentlemen, it appears that you know the opera ghost. Richard rose with the remaining hairs of his moustache in his hand. No, Monsieur Commissary, no, we do not know him, but we wish we did, for this very evening he has robbed us of twenty thousand francs. And Richard turned a terrible look on Moncharmont, which seemed to say, Give me back the twenty thousand francs, or I'll tell the whole story. Moncharmont understood what he meant, for with a distracted gesture he said, Oh, tell everything and have done with it. As for Mifoy, he looked at the managers and at Raoul by turns, and wondered whether he had strayed into a lunatic asylum. He passed his hand through his hair. A ghost, he said, who on the same evening carries off an opera singer and steals twenty thousand francs, is a ghost who must have his hands very full. If you don't mind, we will take the questions in order. The singer first, the twenty thousand francs after. Come, Monsieur de Chagny, let us try to talk seriously. You believe that Mademoiselle Christine Daae has been carried off by an individual called Eric. Do you know this person? Have you seen him? Yes. Where? In a churchyard. Monsieur Mifoy gave a start, began to scrutinize Raoul again, and said, of course, that's where ghosts usually hang out. And what were you doing in that churchyard? 
Monsieur, said Raoul, I can quite understand how absurd my replies must seem to you, but I beg you to believe that I am in full possession of my faculties. The safety of the person dearest to me in the world is at stake. I should like to convince you in a few words, for time is pressing and every minute is valuable. Unfortunately, if I do not tell you the strangest story that ever was from the beginning, you will not believe me. I will tell you all I know about the opera ghost, Monsieur Commissary. Alas, I do not know much. Never mind, go on, go on, exclaimed Richard and Moncharmont, suddenly greatly interested. Unfortunately for their hopes of learning some detail that could put them on the track of their hoaxer, they were soon compelled to accept the fact that Monsieur Raoul de Chagny had completely lost his head. All that story about Perros Girec, death's heads and enchanted violins, could only have taken birth in the disordered brain of a youth mad with love. It was evident, also, that Monsieur Commissary Mifoy shared their view, and the magistrate would certainly have cut short the incoherent narrative if circumstances had not taken it upon themselves to interrupt it. The door opened, and a man entered, curiously dressed in an enormous frock coat and a tall hat, at once shabby and shiny, that came down to his ears. He went up to the commissary and spoke to him in a whisper. It was doubtless a detective, come to deliver an important communication. During this conversation, Monsieur Mifoy did not take his eyes off Raoul. At last, addressing him, he said, Monsieur, we have talked enough about the ghost. We will now talk about yourself a little, if you have no objection. You were to carry off Mademoiselle Christine Daae tonight? Yes, Monsieur le Commissaire. After the performance? Yes, Monsieur le Commissaire. All your arrangements were made. Yes, Monsieur le Commissaire. The carriage that brought you was to take you both away. There were fresh horses in readiness at every stage. That is true, Monsieur le Commissaire. And nevertheless, your carriage is still outside the rotunda awaiting your orders, is it not? Yes, Monsieur le Commissaire. Did you know that there were three other carriages there in addition to yours? I did not pay the least attention. They were the carriages of Mademoiselle Sorelli, which could not find room in the Corps de l'Administration, of Carlotta, and of your brother, Monsieur le Comte de Chagny. Very likely. What is certain is that, though your carriage and Sorelli's and Carlotta's are still there by the rotunda pavement, Monsieur le Comte de Chagny's carriage is gone. This has nothing to say to... I beg your pardon. Was not Monsieur le Comte opposed to your marriage with Mademoiselle Daae? That is a matter that only concerns the family. You have answered my question. He was opposed to it. And that was why you were carrying Christine Daae out of your brother's reach. Well, Monsieur de Chagny, allow me to inform you that your brother has been smarter than you. It is he who has carried off Christine Daae. Oh, impossible, moaned Raoul, pressing his hand to his heart. Are you sure? Immediately after the artist's disappearance, which was procured by means which we have still to ascertain, he flung into his carriage, which drove right across Paris at a furious pace. Across Paris? asked poor Raoul in a hoarse voice. What do you mean by across Paris? Across Paris and out of Paris, by the Brussels Road. Oh, cried the young man, I shall catch them! And he rushed out of the office. And bring her back to us, cried the commissary gaily. Ah, that's a trick worth two of the Angel of Musics. And turning to his audience, Monsieur Mouffoy delivered a little lecture on police methods. I don't know for a moment whether Monsieur le Comte de Chagny has really carried Christine Daae off or not, but I want to know, and I believe that at this moment no one is more anxious to inform us than his brother. 
and now he is flying in pursuit of him. He is my chief auxiliary. This, gentlemen, is the art of the police, which is believed to be so complicated, and which, nevertheless, appears so simple, as soon as you see that it consists in getting your work done by people who have nothing to do with the police. But Monsieur le Commissaire de Police Mifoy would not have been quite so satisfied with himself if he had known that the rush of his rapid emissary was stopped at the entrance to the very first corridor. A tall figure blocked Raoul's way. "'Where are you going so fast, Monsieur de Chagny?' asked a voice. Raoul impatiently raised his eyes and recognized the ostrichen cap of an hour ago. He stopped. "'It's you!' he cried in a feverish voice. "'You, who know Eric's secrets and don't want me to speak of them! Who are you?' "'You know who I am. I am the Persian.'" End of chapter 18 The Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux Chapter 19 The Viscount and the Persian Raoul now remembered that his brother had once shown him that mysterious person, of whom nothing was known except that he was a Persian, and that he lived in a little old-fashioned flat in the Rue de Rivoli. The man with the ebony skin, the eyes of jade, and the astrakhan cap bent over Raoul. "'I hope, Monsieur de Chagny,' he said, "'that you have not betrayed Eric's secret.' "'And why should I hesitate to betray that monster, sir?' Raoul rejoined haughtily, trying to shake off the intruder. "'Is he your friend, by any chance?' "'I hope that you said nothing about Eric, sir, "'because Eric's secret is also Christine Daïs, "'and to talk about one is to talk about the other.' "'Oh, sir,' said Raoul, becoming more and more impatient, "'you seem to know many things that interest me, "'and yet I have no time to listen to you. "'Once more, Monsieur Chagny, where are you going so fast?' "'Can you not guess? To Christine Daï's assistance.' "'Then, sir, stay here, for Christine Daï is here.' "'With Eric? Or with Eric? How do you know? "'I was at the performance, and no one in the world but Eric could contrive an abduction like that. "'Oh,' he said with a deep sigh, "'I recognize the monster's touch. "'You know him, then?' "'The Persian did not reply, but heaved a fresh sigh. "'Sir,' said Raoul, "'I do not know what your intentions are, "'but can you do anything to help me? "'I mean to help Christine Daï. "'I think so, Monsieur de Chagny, "'and that is why I spoke to you. "'What can you do? "'Try to take you to her, and to him. "'If you can do me that service, sir, "'my life is yours. "'One word more. "'The commissary of police tells me "'that Christine Daï had been carried off "'by my brother, Count Philippe. "'Oh, Monsieur de Chagny, I don't believe a word of it. "'It's not possible, is it? "'I don't know if it is possible or not, "'but there are ways and ways of carrying people off, "'and Monsieur le Comte Philippe has never, as far as I know, "'had anything to do with witchcraft. "'Your arguments are convincing, sir, and I am a fool. "'Oh, let us make haste! "'I place myself entirely in your hands. "'How should I not believe you when you are the only one to believe me?' when you are the only one not to smile when Eric's name is mentioned. And the young man impetuously seized the Persian's hands. They were ice cold. Silence, said the Persian, stopping and listening to the distant sounds of the theatre. We must not mention that name here. Let us say he and him, then there will be less danger of attracting his attention. Do you think he is near us? It is quite possible, sir, if he is not, at this moment with his victim, in the house on the lake. "'Ah, so you know that house, too. "'If he is not there, he may be here, "'in this wall, in this floor, in this ceiling. "'Come.' "'And the Persian, asking Raoul to deaden the sound of his footsteps, "'led him down passages which Raoul had never seen before, "'even at the time when Christine used to take him for walks "'throughout that labyrinth. "'If only Darius has come,' said the Persian. "'Who is Darius? "'Darius, my servant.' They were now in the centre of a real deserted square, an immense apartment ill-lit by a small lamp. The Persian stopped Raoul, and in the softest of whispers asked, "'What did you say to the commissary?' "'I said, 
that Christine Dye's abductor was the angel of music, alias the opera ghost, that the real name was... Hush! And did he believe you? No. He attached no importance to what you said? No. He took you for a bit of a madman? Yes. So much the better, sighed the Persian. And they continued their road. After going up and down several staircases which Raoul had never seen before, the two men found themselves in front of a door which the Persian opened with a master key. 